Hello and welcome to today's episode of On the Line with Z Youth. My name is Derek Crawford and I'm the youth pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Clear Lake, Iowa. Let me give you a quick rundown to those who are new to this space. Over the next few minutes, we are going to explore some areas and topics of Christianity, then break them down a little bit and hopefully apply them back to our daily lives. Let's check it out. So in the last couple of videos, we've been discussing the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we were setting up the backstory and then kind of laying the biblical foundation for the rest to kind of grow off of. Well, this week we're going to skip ahead quite a bit and we're going to focus on chapters 15 through 20. Now, I, I understand that I did skip over some important stuff. Uh, these chapters helped form Jesus' ministry and so I, they are very important. Uh, in this time, he gathered his disciples, he performed many miracles, he healed the broken, and he taught the people. And this is kind of fun to this is kind of fun to see watching Jesus begin his ministry, watch him build his team, watch him uh, to to heal people. It, it, it really, to me, I, I really related to it as a youth pastor to kind of look at it and be like, man, I could really, I could really follow that that pattern. And when I'm looking to build ministry, as I'm looking to build programs, however. With this, with this uh, series, we can't focus on everything. The, the, the Bible's too expansive and the book of Matthew even by itself is too big. And so we're gonna focus on a, on a section of it. And so I'm sorry if that, if that sounded like a really cool part of it, but hopefully we'll have some time in another video to go back to that. But at the time of chapters 15 through 20, the ministry of Jesus was in full swing and the book of Matthew had purposely started setting Jesus up as this role of teacher, which was commonly attributed to Moses. And so many thought that uh, what Matthew was doing is that they were trying to establish Jesus as the new Moses. But I think what, to me, what I think was more prevalent is that idea that they were setting him up to be the teacher. Uh, and, and that's kind of what he did throughout the book of Matthew is he, he, was, he was teaching. And so uh, first off, I want to make a quick point that I think is very important is that a lot of times the Pharisees and the Sadducees that you read about in the Bible often get looked at as the bad guy. They're pinned as the, as the, as the bad person, the, the person that sit, stands in contrast to Jesus. So we automatically assume them as being terrible people. But I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I believe many of them probably did love God and thought what they were doing was the right way to do it. The problem with it is that like all leaders, including myself and all the leaders of the church, uh, we still sin, like sin is still a thing that happens. And so before we quick to just push the Sadducees and the Pharisees aside, kind of keep that in mind as we as we move forward, because I think that's important to, to kind of note, to kind of pull out of it. Now, they were wrong in many aspects of what they did, or at least their reaction probably wasn't the best, but just don't look at them like they're the most terrible people in the world. But anyway, uh, this sin that we were talking about kind of leads to this next part. The Pharisees would approach Jesus and ask his thoughts on specific topics. Like in public, they would go to him and uh, ask him about certain topics. But they didn't do this out of a sign of respect for him or that they uh, wanted to learn from him because he was the teacher. Uh, actually, they probably had no intention of learning from him. What they were doing is that they were looking to trap Jesus in a contradiction. They wanted Jesus to stumble and either support the Bible, but then anger, you know, the Jewish customs of that day, or they wanted them to side with the people and those customs and then contradict the Bible or other biblical fi figures. Uh, Jesus didn't end up falling into this trap. Uh, he, he would instead point them back to scripture and kind of show them how they were misinterpreting it. They were misunderstanding the point of these verses that they were throwing at Jesus to trap him. And so, and there's even in one point in Matthew 12, verses seven, Jesus straight up responds to them in this way, basically said, if you, if you knew the words that I mean, you would not have condemned the innocent. Basically saying like, if you truly understood what was going on, you wouldn't uh, treat me like this, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't treat us like this. And so basically he would, he, what he would do is he'd go and he would correct the wrong parts, the wrong teachings that they were uh, talking about. And he would then show them how that looks in the kingdom of heaven. And so uh, there were several times that he did this throughout Matthew, but uh, some of them that 
fit into the section I'm talking about was he did at the beginning of Matthew 15, at the beginning of Matthew 16, and at the beginning of Matthew 19. The Pharisees would approach Jesus publicly looking to test him and were uh, trying to look superior to him. The Pharisees were hoping to win an argument and bring honor to themselves while at the same time kind of putting shame on Jesus. So basically bringing him down to kind of lift themselves up. And so in chapter 15, the Pharisees were getting on to the disciples for breaking tradition and that Jesus had to correct them on. And then in chapter 17, the Pharisees wanted Jesus to uh, kind of prove who he was by showing them different signs. And then in chapter 19, which is the one I, I want to focus on for a little bit today, is uh, Jesus or the Pharisees were challenging Jesus on the aspect of divorce. And I want to be quick to tell you, this is not going to be a, a sermon about divorce, but I think the, the, that chapter is a good indicator of how Jesus responded in each case. And I think, I don't know, and that's what I wanted to use it. So I'm not here to kind of talk about divorce as much as I am to look at Jesus's response to the Pharisees on this topic. And so if you look at verse 19, uh, there was some major uh, tension brewing at this time. And there was a lot of uh, debate and tension over the the topic of divorce. And they were putting Jesus right in the front of this dispute in verse 3 by asking him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And what's cool about Jesus's response is that uh, he doesn't really talk about divorce as much. Instead, he turns them to Genesis 2 and talks about the creational intent of marriage. So instead of talking about divorce, he's like, no, no, no. I want to come and show you what I mean by marriage. This is what I think marriage is. And so he kind of reminds them of that. Uh, he doesn't shy away and is very clear on what that he thought divorce was meant to be permanent and that God brought two together to form one one body and make one union. And but that wasn't enough for the Pharisees. They kind of they still kept trying to pull it back to legal issues. And so they countered and basically said, well, you know, Moses had allowed divorce and they were right. In Deuteronomy 24, uh, G, uh, Moses basically allows divorce. And but Jesus quickly responds and basically says, you know, that wasn't necessarily a, a command. Uh, when he said that divorce was okay, basically what he was doing was, is you guys were already doing it anyway, and that he kind of, he, he brought order to something you guys were already doing. And that, uh, Jesus kind of pushes it back to this idea that if divorce happened, it's because there was sin involved, that in some way that sin forced that relationship apart. And I think that's very interesting, uh, because, you know, we look at things in the way we want to look at them and we we judge divorce and we judge uh, marriage the way we look at it. And so it's kind of interesting to see how Jesus uh, takes it. And he continues on with his thoughts on divorce and he teaches about, uh, he does leave in a clause for sexual immorality, basically saying that divorce is, is allowed through that. Uh, and I think this is all this all is all also interesting because it connects back to the Sermon on the Mount because where he talks about divorce there and yet they didn't you know they still challenge him here and he kind of furthers further discusses the, the topic and so anyway what I think it kind of what I think it kind of shows is uh, Jesus has a different intent he has a di- different way of viewing the world than what they were wanting from it and they were trying to challenge him on this and trying to to make him trip up and he never seemed to do this. But what it really comes down to is that the Pharisees were beginning to feel threatened. There was a sense of power and prestige and wealth associated with their position and Jesus was starting to threaten that existence. Jesus wanted the ideals of the Beatitudes to reign true. He was combating, you know, the power and the greed and selfishness of the people, specifically the the Pharisees at that time. And so that's where we're going to end it today. In the next video, we're going to kind of answer the question, the kingdom of heaven is blank. And so if you wish to keep reading along, we're going to explore Matthew 13 and Matthew 19. And so uh, here are the reflection questions. Uh, Have you ever been in a position of authority? maybe on a team, at work, or any other leadership position at school, how would you feel if that position was taken away? The next question, if you were around during this time, could you honestly say that you would believe Jesus? That you would be one of the first ones to follow him? Would you be like, yeah, this guy gets it? What do you think? Do you think you would? And then the final question is, what are some of the areas in your life where sin, such as power and greed and selfishness, kind of take hold? 
What are some of the areas in your life where that happens? That about wraps it up for today. Thank you so much for checking us out. Remember that it takes a lot to put everything on the line for Jesus, but I promise you it's worth it. Until next time, blessings to you.